Welcome back Guardians. What happens when we are faced with an enemy that gets stronger when we fight back? An enemy that benefits from combat? Guardians solve all their problems with a bullet to the face. What happens when that doesn't work? Well, this is why we are talking about Zevu Arath, the Hive God of War. Week 6 of Season of the Seraph revealed Zevu Arath's advantage over Guardians and the city. The more we fight back, the stronger she gets, and if Rashbutin uses the Warsat network to take out the Hive, the mass destruction that results may give Zevu enough power to end us all. So today I'm going to give you the backstory of Zevu, how she became the Hive God of War, how fighting back empowers her, with some examples like the invasion of the Cabal home planet and Sagira, and finally what this means for us. But before starting, this video is sponsored by Raycon's Everyday Earbuds. This pair of Raycon's I've had for two and a half years. I pretty much use every day and they still work perfectly fine. Kindly, Raycon did send me a new pair this year. But my point is this, I don't have sponsors on the channel that I don't use or products that I don't use. My second point is the price point for Raycon's everyday earbuds is great. You get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands, and it will last. My daily use of Raycon earbuds has now evolved to playing Magic the Gathering Arena on my phone. I gave up my addiction to physical Magic cards a while ago, but Arena has got its hooks back in. The everyday earbuds have plenty of play time with 8 hours, which is more than enough for a couple of cheeky games. And if I'm traveling and I can't get to a wall charger, the case itself holds up to 32 hours of battery life. They're super easy to pair. Once you've paired them to your phone, you don't need to worry about pairing them again. Just open the case, turn on your Bluetooth on your phone, and you're done. Maybe your New Year's goals are more fitness orientated rather than playing games on your phone like me. And in that case, Raycon's everyday earbuds are very handy too. You can tap the logo to turn up the volume, down the volume, play or pause the song so you don't have to access your phone. Great if you are running or working out and want to adjust your playlist on the go. If you want to see why Raycon's everyday earbuds have over 50,000 five-star reviews, click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash mylan for 15% off your next Raycon purchase. With that, let's begin this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. Let's begin. To understand Zevu Arath's power and how her worm functions, we need to dive back into the Books of Sorrow from the Taken King expansion in 2015. Out of all the Osmian siblings, Oryx, Savathun, and Zivu, it was Zivu who thrived off combat and was destined to be a knight. While Oryx would inevitably become more powerful through the use of Taken powers, and Savathun would use her cunning to her advantage, Zivu would still describe herself as the strongest, saying, War is mine, and I am strongest. It was in her nature to fight. Before the Hive had immortality and even strength, Zivu, or Zyro as she was called back then, would risk her life to fight predators known as Stormjoys on the planet The Fundament. We don't really know what exactly Stormjoys look like, but they sound like tentacle creatures that fly. Nightmare fuel. Have a listen to the Predator's Grimoire card from the Books of Sorrow. It reads, A Stormjoy. A Stormjoy is a living cloud. When it passes over our continent, it lowers its feeding tentacles. On each tentacle are the bait stars. Although light makes you happy, you must avoid it. You will be eaten. A Stormjoy is a good way for an old person to choose death. Also, a daring knight can cut the bait stars from the tentacles. I have six. Because her nature was so aligned with proving her strength, this is how she became the Hive God of War. When the Osmian siblings made the bargain with the worm gods and took on the worm larvae, part of the bargain was to obey their nature forever. Have a listen to the bargain Grimmel card from the Books of Sorrow. It reads, You must obey your nature forever. In your immortality, Orash, you may never cease to explore and inquire for the sake of your children. In your immortality, Zyro, you may never cease to test your strength. In your immortality, Sathona, you may never abandon cunning. If you do, your worm will consume you. And as your power grows, O princes, so will your worm's appetite. So Zyro, Zivu Arath, must obey her nature. And the way that she constantly tests her strength is through war. 
The worms that were accepted as part of the bargain need to be fed through the tithing of death and also by obeying their nature. However, the catch is, as the worm gets larger, it hungers for more. And so the hive are trapped in a never-ending cycle of becoming stronger or the worm will consume them. Oryx invented this tithing system where lesser hive would kill something, take their energy from killing and feed their own worm, and then the excess killing energy would be tithed to their superior, eventually ending with the hive leadership. That way, Oryx, Savathun and Zivu could grow stronger and still manage that ever-growing hunger of their worms. Savathun tried to modify this system to be about trickery. Anytime anyone spoke about Savathun, misunderstood her, were tricked, it would satisfy her worm. And so in Zivu's case, her worm feeds on war. This was confirmed in the week 6 in-game dialogue between Osiris and Marisov. Have a listen. We have no time for pleasantries, Osiris. I bring grim tidings. My Techians have been trying to make sense of Zivu Arath's tactics. Her armies are legion, yet she commits minimal forces to battle. Minimal forces? Every Wrathborn we cut down is replaced by two more. She could replace them tenfold, so why does she show restraint? Her worm feeds on warfare. The more violent the act, the greater the power she draws from it. Much like Savathun's worm fed on guile and deceit. Do you mean to say that... This is not a war. It is a ritual. Her death singers weave their magic and prepare for a grand sacrifice. If so, our strategy remains unchanged. Retake the war sets and eradicate the Wrathborn. Just as Zivu Arath desires, the Warsats are immensely powerful. Their use would result in unparalleled destruction. She cares not which side is obliterated. Her worm will gorge itself on the carnage either way. She would turn her armies into blood sacrifices. And the Warsats would be the blade. Overwhelming force has proven to be the only effective tactic against the Hive. Without it, I... I do not know what to do. Then I suggest you think of something, and quickly. I will apprise your vanguard of these findings. So you might be thinking, nah, let's just fight back. What's the worst that could happen? We can just muscle through this, right? Well, we have some pretty good examples of what happens when you fight back against Zivu. Example 1 is the Gabal homeworld. Example 2 is Osiris and Sagira. The Gabal had to flee their home planet because of Zivu Arath and her forces. Zivu Arath was summoned to the planet as part of Savathun's plan. Savathun essentially corrupted an advisor of Keitel, Uman Arath, forcing Keitel to kill her own advisor, which in turn summoned the Hive God of War. Have a listen to the lore entry, New Gods, from the lore book Empress. It reads, Keitel stood before Uman in the flickering green light of the fire. Your obsession is a weakness, she said and a threat to our prosperity. You can't stop it now, Uman lilted, breathless with delight. Ziva Rath, hear me. Kaidal didn't break her stare. I have no choice but to... Uman, chuckling, raised her hands. They glowed. The fire behind her burned higher and chattered it like rattling bones. The war is all there is, she said. As the chattering reached a fevered pitch, Kaidal made a decision. With the lightning quick reflexes Uman had taught her, she unsheathed the ceremonial sword at her side and ran it through Uman's middle. Uman laughed. You are war, and I conjure you with war and blood. She laughed and laughed and laughed until her mouth began to ooze, until Kaidal, disgusted, pushed her off the sword with her foot. The body tumbled back onto the green blaze. A gift for my favourite sister. As the fire consumed the corpse, a gargantuan portal opened in the sky. From there, Zivu's forces overwhelmed the Cabal home planet, and Zivu's voice booms across the battlefield, delivering one of the most terrifying sentences in all of Destiny. The battle song lore entry from the Empress lore book reads, A voice as loud as thunder spoke to her, deafening. My home is war. My voice is a battle song. For as long as you have worshipped war, you have worshipped me. I am here to claim my tribute. It is overdue. 
easily one of my favorite pieces of lore in Destiny. So this invasion was set up by Savathun, but it's not the only example of Zivu being summoned by war. Zivu was summoned by war for the first time in the Books of Sorrow. Oryx had actually already killed Savathun and Zivu to gain enough power to take on Akka, the Worm God. And after Oryx had gained the power to take and became the Taken King, he went on to wage war against the Ecumene. Have a listen to the carved in ruin lore entry from the Books of Sorrow. It reads, Oryx made war on the Ecumene for a hundred years. At the end of those hundred years, he killed the Ecumene Council on the Fractal Wreath. And from their blood rose Ziva Wrath, saying, I am war, and you have conjured me back with war. This is the scary thing about Zivu. In the Books of Sorrow, she declares, The world is my court, wherever there is war. And even though Savathun played a part in summoning Zivu to invade the Cabal homeworld, it very much seems that Zivu can have a presence wherever there is war, and it seems with the help of some ritual, she can be summoned. I mean, technically, she should be unstoppable by now, considering how many gods we have slain and turned into weapons. But maybe the ritual component has not yet been fulfilled, which is what Mara was speaking about in the earlier cutscene, using the Warsats to destroy the Hive, might be the spark that Zivu needs to launch her invasion. One of the most interesting cases of a Guardian facing Zivu Wrath is the story of Osiris and Sagira. And technically, Sagira used one of the few strategies that could beat Zivu self-sacrifice. Let me explain. Zevia Wrath used her High Celebrant to create cryptoliths which corrupt other Hive, Fallen, and Cabal. Osiris was investigating the cryptoliths and inevitably ended up battling the Hive, and as an extremely powerful, experienced, and accomplished Warlock, he destroyed them, and kinda enjoyed it. This death acts like a summoning ritual and activates these sigils around the area to summon the Will of Zivu. Asaras doesn't even face Zivu in the flesh, rather he is given an absolute beatdown just from the will of Zivu. Have a listen to the web lore Immolent Part 2, and then I'll explain a little bit more. Asaras revels in the slaughter. Zivu Wrath's sigil drinks in his fervor and the noble's deaths. Laughter like screaming fear. Her visage emboldens. The celebrant waits at the foot of Zivu Wrath's cryptolith, unburnt. Osiris echoes reconvene into him. Face me, he exclaims and steps forward. Zivirath's visage emits a shock wave that thunders through the chasm. It rips away Osiris' well and throws him across the stone floor. His back slams against the cliff face behind him. What is this? Shock punctuates the question. He pulls against an unseen force to no avail. You burn offerings, I accept them. Zivirath's will crushes the pressure of his light, seals the flames into his flesh, stakes his body to the stone on paralytic pins. Her image distorts in a concave canvas around him, the celebrant at its core. Shadows encroach, dousing the borders of his power. Osiris focuses his mind on the spark at his core. Flames billow from within. Countless gilded echoes ripple from him, testing Zivu's hold, pressing vulnerabilities. The sun sings to repel the shadow. He finds a moment, wrenches a hand free, and unleashes the reach of chaos. The beam of arc tears through Zivu's sigil. Sulfide shards rocket away as cracks fork through Zivu Wrath's projection. Unfazed, she does not relent. Resist me, lie bearer. Her will overcomes him, stronger than before. His light is breaking. Osiris, why don't you ever listen to me? She compiles in front of him. What are you? Shut up, listen to my words. Her iris is bright with light. There are great things still left for you. Don't lose hope in the darkness. She's luminant. Osiris breathes the word as if he could hold it back. No. He would understand in time. She had seen it. Blinding light erupts from Sagira's core as she splits apart. A wave of light surges and tears across the chasm. Her sacrifice cleanses every trace of Zivirath's presence. The sigil erased. The cryptolith that supported her projection destroyed. Osiris draws breath, alone. The ages of Sagira's light stand strong in the shadow of the pyramid for days. So Sagira sacrifices herself in an explosion of light ridding the area of Zivu's presence. You likely notice that the more Osiris fought back, the stronger Zivu became. The choices were run, 
or sacrifice. What makes Ziva Wrath an even greater foe is she's not just this blunt force, she has developed into quite the tactician. In just this season alone, she tried to subjugate Clovis Bray. Her cryptolyphs not only corrupted the minds of living things, but also corrupted mechanisms. Anna said that Zivu's presence was causing the Clovis Bray lab protocols to cannibalize themselves. Later, it was referred to as a virus infecting the submind network. Zivu also tried to install a hive soul in the place of the submind. As you can see, these are not blunt force tactics. Zivu is being quite clever in trying to acquire the submind data. Zivu's overall plan is perfect. She's trying to gain access to the Warsat network, which is capable of creating a world ending event. This forces Guardians to respond. We can't just let Zivu gain control of the system. But as we fight back, she increases in power. If we do nothing, we lose. If we fight back with the Warsats, we lose likely triggering a summoning ritual. And this is why week six of Season of the Seraph ended with the only possible thing we could do, a stalemate. Our plan is to gain control over the Warsat network, denying Zivu, but do not use it. I am very interested to see where this goes. I would absolutely love to see Zivu Wrath in game, and I really want to see how this would play out. How do you have a boss in a loot and shooter that you can't shoot? And with that, that concludes this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. If you'd like to support the channel and cannot think of a comment, you can leave the word Zivu Arath. As usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.